In the last video, I explained the basics of GP programming using matrix multiplication as an example. Ultimately, I achieved a 2000x improvement over the sequential code. This was an amazing result, but the problem size in this example was fairly large. It would be more interesting to see how the computations on the GPU scale with more modest problem sizes. Starting with a small matrix size of 64 and going up to just over 2000, execution time on the CPU increases drastically. GPU execution time on the other end remains almost the same, but for small matrices, the CPU is magnitudes faster than the GPU. It's only around the matrix size of 500 that the CPU execution time exceeds that of the GPU. From what I've discussed in the last video, we cannot really answer why this is happening. And my rule whenever something like this happens is to always return to the fundamentals. In this case, that would be the GPU hardware. The GPU is organized into an array of highly threaded streaming multiprocessors, or SMs. Each SM has several processing units or CUDA cores with the same control logic. The SMs also contain a different on-chip memory shared amongst the CUDA cores inside the SM. GPU also has a much larger off-chip memory, the main component of which is global memory or VRAM. In the last video, I covered how CPU and GPU work together. However, I will go over that again. The program starts with a single CPU thread that initializes matrices. The same thread allocates memory and then copies data to the GPU's global memory. After that, we call the kernel function by defining the grid and block dimensions. We need to understand how the GPU threads are mapped to the actual hardware. In this example, let's say I call an 8x8 block and as the matrix dimension is 32 by 32, there will be 16 blocks arranged in a 4x4 grid. Note that each green dot here is a thread that will run independently in parallel. When the kernel function is called, the blocks are assigned randomly to different SMs. There are three things that we should remember. All threads in a block gets assigned to a single SM. Any block can go anywhere and execute in any order. So our code should not assume anything regarding the order of execution of the blocks. One SM can also be assigned to multiple blocks. When the blocks are assigned to SM, the on-chip memory is divided so that one block may only access its share of the on-chip memory. For a moment, it might look like an odd choice not to let threads in different blocks interact with each other. However, this feature allows for transparent scalability where the same code can run on different hardware with different parallelization capacities. For instance, if this code is run on a GPU with fewer CUDA codes, it scales automatically without any errors. I mean, the execution will be slower, but accurate. So far, we have focused on how a grid of blocks is executed by multiple SMs. Let's now see how each block is executed within an individual SM. Conceptually, the programmer should assume the threads in a block can execute in any order, and the correctness of the algorithm should not depend on the order in which the threads are executed. Thread scheduling in CUDA GPUs is a hardware implementation concept that varies depending on the type of hardware used. In most implementations, once a block is assigned to an SM, it is divided into 32 thread unit called warps. For a 2D block like this, threads are linearized using a row major layout and then first 32 threads are bundled into warp 0 and the next 32 make warp 1. A genuine question now is, why should we care about this? We as programmers should understand the concept behind warps because the knowledge of warps is useful for understanding and optimizing the performance of good applications. Consider a matrix multiplication example. We have already seen that there will be a few blocks whose threads lie outside the matrix bounds. To avoid any data corruption, we use a simple if-else statement. This is where we need to understand how warps work around a situation like this. Let's isolate a single thread and look at the last warp. The GPU hardware can accommodate such large threads because a small portion of the die is reserved for the control unit. This means a warp is given a single instruction and the whole warp must follow the same execution path. This is a problem for a case like this where some threads will follow the if statement and rest goes to the else side. In a situation like this where threads exhibit what's known as control divergence, hardware will take multiple passes through these diverging paths. That is, first through if by disabling the first few threads and then through else by disabling the ones that were previously enabled. This adds load to the execution resources. Now, before I move ahead, I want to mention that this is not a big issue for matrix multiplication because the percentage of warps that exhibit control divergence is quite small. But for some algorithms that I will cover in a future video, this can be a big problem. 
for matrix multiplication, the part that takes the longest is the loop performing dot product. More specifically, the global memory accesses. This kernel function performs just two operations for eight bytes accessed from the global memory. And mind you, these memory accesses are extremely slow. This is exactly why GPU is slower than a CPU for smaller matrices, as it's losing a lot more while moving data than it gains from parallelism. However, this does not explain why the execution time for GPU is almost the same as the problem size increases. I mean, with an increase in the data size, memory accesses are also increasing, so technically execution time should increase as well. This does not happen because the GPU hardware is designed for latency tolerance. Let me explain this using a simple example. Consider a single SM with a few CUDA codes. A smaller problem will generate a few threads and at any given time, there is a chance that a good amount of them will be waiting around for the data to be copied from global memory. Now as the problem size increases, GPU hardware assigns more threads to the SM than its cores. This is possible because GPU hardware has a lot of space designated for the registers as well. So at the start of the execution, registers are assigned to the threads to hold their state and when a bunch of them are waiting around for their data, the cores switch to different threads almost instantaneously and work on them while other threads are retrieving their data. This process is known as latency tolerance, where the GPU fills the latency time of operations from some threads with work from others and the ability to hide these long latency operations increases with the dataset size. I mean, it's obvious that the more threads are available, the easier it will be for the cores to switch. Now you might be thinking that this means we should allocate as many threads to an SM as possible. However, CUDA limits this kind of thing. Most importantly, a block cannot have more than 1024 threads. This means the max we can do is a 32 by 32 block now we can obviously change the x dimension to 64, but then we have to decrease the y dimension to 16. A genuine question now is whether there is a way to reduce these global memory accesses. The answer is yes, and this is where we need to utilize another on-chip memory known as shared memory. The basic idea here is to move a subset of data to the shared memory once, perform a bunch of operations on that, and then move on to the next subset. This goes on for the complete dataset and using the shared memory, we can reduce the long latency operations from the global memory. The topics discussed in this video were quite theoretical. Nonetheless, it's important to know all this. And I could have covered a lot more, but I decided against that. Instead, I wrote a detailed blog post on my website that you can think of as notes for this video. Anyways, thanks a lot for watching. Please let me know what you think down in the comments and I will see you next time.